S in Hell, a look back at Saturday Night Live with your hosts, Matt and Keith. Brought to you by Lion's Den Audio Theater. Like and subscribe to Lion's Den Audio Theater for more Lion's Den goodness. And here are your hosts, Keith and Matt. Saturday Night Live, Season 3, Episode 16, starring Michael Palin, originally aired on April 8th, 1978. Welcome to SN Hell. My name is Keith. With me as always, good buddy Matt. Hello, Matt. Hello, Keith. Joining us for the first time since the Steve Martin Nitty Gritty Dirt Band episode, we have Adrian. Hello, Adrian. Hello, guys. You're sort of becoming our resident Python expert. This is a delight for me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your favorite Python, Michael Palin, right? It is my favorite. John yeah. and I were talking about that today, and he was like, ooh, you get to do your favorite. And I was like, who's yours? He was like... I guess I'm a basic bitch because it's John Cleese. Yeah. You know, I've never been able to pick a favorite. I mean, it's a close call for all of them, but he's he's always been my boy. Yeah, yeah. And so he's the third Python that we actually see during a Saturday Night Live show. Second to host, we actually saw Graham Chapman very briefly in a George Harrison music video. Palin is the uh, one of the Pythons, one of the six. Um, the only one to be knighted and universally regarded as the nicest of the Pythons. I mean, I don't know a lot about him. John Cleese is clearly a prick. And Eric <laughs> Idle seems like a distant weirdo. And the others are just kind of like eccentric geniuses that are probably uncomfortable to talk to. So, yeah, it, it definitely <laughs> tracks. <laughs> So Matt, in a, in a weird little, uh, I don't know if this happens again throughout the run of the show. I didn't check. But Christopher Lee, our last episode, also knighted. So we have back-to-back knights. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it happens again. It must happen again, or by the time we get there, it will have happened again. Musical guest tonight, Eugene Record. We are going to get to that a little later. You guys good to jump right in? I'm yes, good. sir. Awesome. Disclaimer, Grandma Walton tries to tie her shoelace. By now, the wheels have fallen off these disclaimers. We need something gritty and offensive again i think matt yeah this isn't funny this one i was just i rolled my eyes it was you know uh freshen up or cut it yeah have you seen one of these disclaimers before adrian i think so yeah but this Mm. one was pretty lame yeah yeah so we go to the cold open it's the oscars bill and lorraine present the award to vanessa redgrave and vanessa is played by jane jane says there's so many people to condemn And she lists a bunch of different politically active groups or militias or whatever and refers to them as hoodlums and says she can't name them all because somebody will be left out. She then shares the award with the equally political Yasser Arafat, played by Belushi. He didn't prepare anything, and he keeps doing, like, the excited woot exhale, like, whew, and uh, is just really happy. He thanks the gorillas who aren't appreciated. He then brings out Anwar Sadat, played by Garrett. They hug. Sadat accepts the award. He says he usually winces at mixing showbiz and politics. Then he brings up Jimmy Carter, who accepts the award. And Jimmy calls out an example from earlier in the show and says he's sick of people using the Oscars to honor achievement in the film industry. Says he only has one thing he wants to say, and that is live from New York at Saturday night. This sketch was not overly funny some fun impressions in there i got a kick out of jane got a kick out of belushi but they have no idea how bad and how political the oscars are going to get this is very prophetic and so it gets a little point from that but i didn't laugh too much i enjoyed it i thought it was topical uh and it was fast-paced and the the impressions from belushi i thought was hilarious and I like Jane doing characters instead of just playing like straight woman X. And, you know, I wish there was a little more energy on the, the you know, the live from New York is Saturday night, but it is what it is. Uh, but I thought it was a good, fast paced, cold open. I uh, see it was topical, but you can do topical and still be funny. Like, you know, he's Yasser Arafat, but he's like, whew. <laughs> you know, it's still, he can still be a funny guy. Uh, weekend update should take notes. I really liked it. Yeah, same. I, I hadn't really thought about how the Oscars weren't political at that point. Um, so it kind of seemed very in place when I was just looking at it. But, uh, I, I did appreciate the impressions. Jane's condemnation of hoodlums pleased me. We then go to the intro. Gilda is back to her eating the apple and the, uh, Kevin Scott thing is now abandoned, of course. 
We go to the monologue. Michael Palin comes down as Palin's manager, Sid Biggs, to announce that Palin is having some costume troubles, and he's basically there to kill time until Michael Palin comes out. So he's making awkward small talk. He says Michael's a good guy who is kind to animals. Wouldn't be nice to a Wolverine that was attacking him, though. Sid talks about how Michael's from a new school of performing that doesn't have one set act, and he offers to show the audience his act, which is, as the band is playing White Cliffs of Dover... He puts a plate of seafood down his pants and asks for two domestic cats. There are several cats throughout the uh, balcony, but he only needs two. Michael puts the seafood salad down his pants and then two real live cats, which are supplied by stage uh, hands, who (laughs) it seems like Michael's trying to keep the cat's head out of their pants. um, But one of the stage hands is just giving her trying to stuff that cat down. I always like when Palin does this voice. He does it quite a bit. I'm not sure how I felt about a monologue being done in character, but I I quickly got over it. The bit was funny, definitely not the norm. I got a big kick of cats being all over the audience. As far as using the cats, the cats were terrified. One cat actually shit all over Michael Palin and pissed on him, and he didn't have time to clean it off. So for the next few sketches, he's, uh, he's, he's dealing with that stench. All things considered, uh, maybe it's not sensitive to the animal lovers, but I got a real kick out of this sketch, um, this monologue. Really liked it. Wondering where you guys are at. We're all cat lovers here, too, I should specify. I didn't love it. (laughs) Um, It felt a little weak, honestly. I mean, I love that voice on Palin because it's a great voice, but it felt as awkward as he seemed to be up there, which was probably the point, but it didn't have the right energy I felt for the start. And then I was stressed out about the cats, especially that gray cat who was clearly not having it. Uh, I hated his ill-fitting suit. Get that uh, it was part of a character now. But uh, initially I did just hate it. Don't use live animals like that. Yes. Yeah. So risky. The cats are clearly uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable watching these ragged stage hands uh, try to shove them down his pants as you mentioned mm-hmm. and uh it would have been easy to just fake the cats but again i guess that's not that as funny or i don't know they shouldn't have been shoving live cats down his pants like was yeah. it real seafood salad it better have been <laughs> <laughs> i think so yeah the uh yeah the stage hand on the right was the one really giving it just trying to stuff the cat in uh it looked like michael was trying to keep the heads out of the pants for probably various reasons there was a super cute moment with the cat just kind of sitting in his pants, peeking out over, just chilling. Yeah. And like he was on TV. Yeah. Ernest Suggs is Princess Margaret eating soil and travels on a horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we now go to an advertisement. It's Little Chocolate Donuts. Quite a coincidence that you're back for this one, Adrian. We don't have to go through it again, but uh, is it still holding up for you guys? I still love Little Chocolate Donuts. I was pumped as soon as they showed Belushi running. <laughs> Uh, it, it has lost slight luster with me this time. I, I felt I'd seen it too recently. You know, I have a Chiron. This woman is peaking. We now go to a confessional. Michael Palin plays a, a priest in a confessional. Dan plays an IRS agent who's checking in on Michael, Father Michael's uh, tax return. Dan wonders how Michael Palin doesn't have a bigger office after 22 years. Dan wonders how someone who makes so little can be traveling to Italy, and he has problems with Palin not keeping receipts from his uh, trips to the shrines. Garrett enters and uh, in the other side of the confessional and says he's made millions of dollars and never paid taxes. He's been fraudulent and has found every loophole he could. Garrett tells Michael uh, this because he said he has to tell someone and knew if he told a priest it wouldn't go any further. Michael is in a moral dilemma, and he looks up and starts praying, and Bill appears as another priest in a thought bubble and wonders who a priest can go to for in such a situation. The scene then cuts to Henry Brock from H&L Brock and gives reason number 12 to call H&L Brock because they solve moral dilemmas. They have tax experts, philosophers, and certified tax theologians that can help. He says he may not be God, but when it comes to taxes, he's the next best thing. A uh, graphic comes up on the screen and says that H&L Brock is the ordained tax people. So about this sketch, a little long, not a great one for kicking off the show. Dan had some good lines. Palin plays a great priest. Um, it was just a really long setup for the H&L Brock bit. It was tax season in the States, so it was timely. The detail I really like about this is so minute. This is not 
Lowell Brock, who we've seen last year because he's been incarcerated. This is Henry Brock, his brother. So uh, I got a kick out of that. But um, it was it was a long meandering piece that uh, probably didn't have to go on as long as it did. I use a spray afterwards. I thought that was a great line. I also really liked if he's not your holiness, you're out of luck. I thought Dan was really good. He did have a, uh, some good lines, but it was, yeah, way too long. Uh, I, I liked that moment of indecision he had in the confessional. You know, I did pop a little for Brock. I didn't notice your the uh, minute detail that you mentioned. But yeah, it wasn't like ha-ha funny, and uh, it was just dragged on. It got kind of boring for me. Yeah, I think probably the same opinion there. It was, it was a bit too long, although Aykroyd had great bits. He plays that sort of character really well. Uh, I really liked Garrett as the tax evader. Just the way he delivered everything in this panic is lovely. The, the slogan, the ordained tax people. I enjoyed that as someone who yeah, yeah. enjoys doing taxes. <laughs> <laughs> we now go to a Chiron. This person is a composite photograph. We now go to the seagull. Uh, Michael Palin introduces the bit. He's to play Trigorian in a production of Chekhov's The Seagull, but he's going to bring something else to the show because he's going to be bound in a straitjacket and locked in a trunk. His goal is to get out in less than one minute and five seconds, hoping to get out right on his cue. Lorraine and Gilda, dressed as magician's assistants, help him with a straitjacket and then lock him in the trunk. Jane and Bill begin to do the seagull. Bill joins her carrying a dead seagull, says he will kill himself uh, that same day. The trunk is placed and a timer starts and Palin struggles to get out of the trunk. He does it and calls out his cue. It turns out that he's taken too long and he starts ranting and raving. Palin teases that he's going to jump into the lumberjack song, but it turns into something about being a claims adjuster. Jane and Bill try to calm him down. They then put him back in the trunk as he starts singing about being a claims adjuster. This was really funny to me. The absurdity of somebody doing this escape act during a production of The Seagull is hilarious. But then to see how Palin handled it was uh, was really funny. And Bill and Jane just continued to perform as he's like flailing on the floor. The tease into the Lumberjack song was okay. I don't know how I felt about that. Um, this is very Python-esque, but it's not necessarily how Python would do it. I also really like this one, the where Jane and Bill just continue performing while he's flailing around on the floor in a bag was absolutely beautiful. I didn't necessarily need the nod to the Lumberjack, but it's okay. It was It was my kind of funny. I pretty much agree with you guys. Uh, I thought the clock, rather the stopwatch style clock, uh, whatever, it was a great touch to have that on screen and follow his uh, thrashing around, which was great physical comedy. It was definitely laugh out loud for me. And you guys are pretty touchy about that song tease. What's up with that? Ah, in one way, it's a cheap thing to include it for a cheap laugh. And the other thing, he teases it and doesn't give it to us. You know what you mean. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was I thought it was cool. We're now off to Eugene Record, uh, who was the lead singer of the uh, the Shy Lights, as Michael Palin announces. And he sings Have You Seen Her? And it's the story of a man whose girlfriend has left him. So he basically sits in the park and talks to kids. First off, I know the song, the cover that MC Hammer had, not the B single, it was the second single from Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him. That's where I first heard it. And I've heard this version over the years. I've never seen it before, though. <laughs> to me, this is the most... 70s the show has ever looked i i really enjoyed this guy's vocal range his his appearance his look his presentation it was cheesy as hell and i might like this for all the wrong reasons but you know i got a real kick out of this probably in a similar way that matt you did with Neil Sedaka in the first uh, season so thumbs up for me on this one i loved this the pink suit the jukebox in the back, his talking breakdowns all throughout the song. It was sexy as fuck. Loved it. Very cool background. Yeah, I like when they make the musical sets kind of unique. And uh, I didn't know what was coming, and then it started, and I was like, what the hell? I know this song. It's good MC Hammer. I thought that was cool. Uh, his cream and pink suit is amazing. And yeah, I thought his performance was pretty good. Uh, it was different, change of pace, which I always like on this show. It's not my favorite kind of music, uh, but it was interesting enough. I was into it. We now go to Weekend Update. This one's brought to you by Saran Wrap, a foil that protects you from Arab assassins. The neutron bomb is canceled, but the fig neutron is in production. Destroys cookies, but not bad puns. 
We get a bit with set designer Leo Yoshimura playing Tong Sung Park, who was a Korean lobbyist. In this case, it's not actually Tong Sung Park. It's Lee Kim, an actor trying to make a name for himself, who paid $5,000 to Dan to get on the show. Belushi does a rant about Radio Music Hall, which is due to be torn down. I did not know about that. And Belushi talks about memories of it. He starts getting all riled up. Again, Jane tries to interrupt him and calm him down. Belushi does another violent, probably his most violent, yet uh, death on the stage. This weekend update was really quick. They seem to have minimized Dan's participation, which is definitely good. Really like Belushi's bit, like the energy of it. Love seeing uh, Yoshimura get cameos. I was extra glad it wasn't like Belushi or Bill coming out in Korean costumes. So I really enjoyed this. Uh, As far as the weekend updates this year are concerned, still weaker than what the last two years have been. Yes, I love the the Fig Neutron bomb pun and the other saran wrap pun yeah it was it was a fine weekend update uh, like you said the less use of dan was probably very beneficial it was interesting how like several times this episode jane has tried to keep things on schedule i think that's true to life <laughs> <laughs> fair enough she's the mom yeah i appreciated the speed of this indeed lines that i liked included forcibly bronzed And the pig is a communist. Didn't really care for the Mr. Kim Park stuff. That didn't really hit. But when the audience groaned at Jane's joke, uh, I like that she gave them the business a little bit. (laughs) John was great. Dan was checked out. So, yeah, that all works for me. And a nice little quick one. What was it Jane said? How quickly they turn or something like that? Yes, that's correct. How quickly they turn. It's in my notes because it was probably my favorite part of it. (laughs) (laughs) We now have a nerd sketch. And this was written by Rosie Schuster and Ann Beats. Todd and Lisa come home home from either school or field hockey and they do just a bunch of their nerd shtick jane comes in as mrs loopner she's now lisa's mom in rather than robert klein's this is really kind of the first true nerd sketch in a house it's not the same house but the bits are falling into place mrs loopner invites todd to stay for dinner but lisa doesn't want him to stay because she has a piano lesson and she's afraid he's going to embarrass her they then go over todd and lisa and play heart and soul on the piano lisa keeps getting mad because todd's coming in too soon michael palin arrives as piano teacher mr brighton he says that lisa looks pretty and todd says yeah pretty bad he's he's incidentally still todd labonta here so todd is just goofing off during the lesson until mrs loopner takes him into the kitchen At which point, Mr. Brighton, who's obviously a very touchy handsy teacher, professes his love for Lisa and tries to make out with her. Todd comes back in, uh, and uh, he and Lisa get rid of Mr. Brighton and go back to playing Heart and Soul. This was not as good as the last nerd's entry, but these two, uh, Bill and Gilda, have excellent chemistry. They're obviously having fun here. And, you know, they're not really making fun of nerds as much as they're putting them in their own little world. They're each other's foil, and then they seem to team up against the world. Jane, excellent as uh, the mother. Uh, A lot of great shtick here. Either, well, enters the lexicon. I don't know if it had been there before. Really enjoyed this sketch. Uh, Not as much as the last nerd sketch, but this one is, it was pretty good. Yeah, it was cute. I mean, as cute as something can be when there's, you know, a rapey piano teacher. But I really liked Gilda and Bill together. And... Their two characters, as annoying as they were, were really cute. I like yeah. the sketch. Jane was great, and uh, Bill and Gilda are really good. The uh, This doesn't make it to the air today, in my opinion. Uh, I really thought the uh, teacher soured the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a little too dark, I thought. So, yeah, again, the, the, the three of them had good performances. Palin was just kind of there. But you can't be making jokes about that. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple things. I think with a couple tweaks, this could make the air today. You know, if Mr. Brighton turns out to just be 19 or something, you might be able to squeak it through. We now go to a Chiron. This woman has rehearsed embarrassment. We're now off to the forgotten memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. Palin is in a pre-tape, and it's he's credited as Orson Welles. I just thought it was some British guy. And he keeps getting his lines cued to him by a crew off camera because he's struggling with his lines. He then throws to the case of the Scarlet Membrane. It's a Sherlock Holmes story where Michael Palin plays Sherlock Holmes. He's playing violin and he has a rolled up dollar bill in his nose and he's shooting at a target at the wall. Jane enters as Mrs. Hudson using her awesome Cockney accent that we adored so much in the Christopher Lee episode. She tells Holmes that he should eat more and do less coke. Dan enters as Watson, and Jane tells him that Holmes has had a little too much Tootski. 
and Watson promises to look into it. Watson says Holmes has all the symptoms of coke, including paranoia. Holmes denies it, thinks Watson is Moriarty in disguise. Bill comes in as Inspector Lestrade with Gilda as Sarah Hammercrack, who wants help with the death of her sister. Holmes figures out the murder and is convinced that he himself is guilty, but everyone assures him that he is not. Belushi has a small role as a constable. The crime is solved and everyone except Holmes and Watson leave. Holmes goes behind the screen and snorts some coke. This sketch could have been a lot shorter, probably could have been a lot better. It seems like they just kind of said, hey, Sherlock Holmes does coke in his books. Let's write a sketch about it. Uh, Production values were awesome. Costumes were great. But the few coke jokes that were in there really didn't sustain it. It didn't seem like the audience was too, too into it. Coupled with the uh, Orson Welles-ish intro, this was way too long and not really that funny. There's so much in the Sherlock Holmes that you can mine, but they kind of hit all the bad stuff here. Um, So this is a pass for me. Overall, it was a pass for me, but I really liked when he got everything wrong and convinced himself that he was the murderer. Something about that worked, but the rest, it was too long. And I didn't even like clue in that him on the cliff failing at his lines was also part of the Sherlock Holmes. I don't know why. With you guys, I didn't like it very much. I thought Jane was funny and uh, Dan's Watson was pretty good. I I liked that he was just looking at a statue of George the First. And I did note the costumes and his dawning realization that he did it and he should be taken away was amazing. But yeah, it was weak. There's not enough laughs in it. And uh, it was pretty disappointing. I, I expected more. We now have party arguments. Bill and Lorraine play a couple with a party to go to. Lorraine doesn't want to go because Bill always goes and sings and chats and makes a fool of himself and doesn't really talk to her at parties. He says he will talk to her. Lorraine says she'll go, but she'll hate it. Bill says she'll hate it because she decided she's hated. And then they decide they aren't going. Somebody from the party calls and asks them to pick up some ice. Lorraine asks Bill to pick up some ice while she gets ready and uh, says she's glad they had the talk and the pair are going to the party. This has got to be a, uh, a Marilyn Miller piece. Uh, I'd be surprised if it wasn't. thought it was really excellent. Again, like all her other stuff, there's not many crazy big laughs in there. But this is a real bit where both are acting and actually acting quite well. Bill sneaks in a couple of over-the-top things that I don't think helped the piece. But uh, there's, you know, this was quite well done. There's uh, elements of this that are familiar and charmingly and frustratingly so. Uh, and and I will admit that I have been both people in this uh, in this sketch at different times of my life. Big thumbs up for me on this one, though. Again, no no big guffaws. Yeah, it wasn't really a funny piece, but it was a really well done piece. I related almost entirely with Lorraine. Maybe that thing I need to work on. <laughs> um, but. Uh... Yeah, I liked it, but it wasn't funny. Uh, it was a little too real for me. It felt like somebody used their uh, the fact that they write for the show as a bit of a therapy session. I thought Lorraine, I got, I was getting mad at Lorraine when I was watching it. So I mean, kudos to her because she was doing it that well. Uh, but also, I mean, I was angry with her. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, and then <laughs> it just ended without much of a joke, and I was yeah. like, did I miss something? Quite the actor, eh? You really saw it in this one. Yeah, she's terrific. And Bill was, I mean, Bill was very, very good in this as well, too. So we now go to Eugene Record's second performance, Trying to Get to You. Same aesthetic, didn't like the song too much. I mean, what the, what a showman, though. It was another sexy tune. I thought this one was super boring. I was glad it was short. This really emphasized that the music is not my style, which is fine, but... Yeah, it's still not. Uh, now, both of you, do you think this song would have worked anywhere as well if it was, or either either of the performances, if it was done in the typical performance space they use for these performances, like the brick wall or whatever? I don't think so. I think it needed the, the extra oomph of his gorgeous suit and that jukebox and the, the band behind him. Although I must say... The trumpet player, how the shadows were falling from his trumpet, made it look like he had wet himself. It was quite <laughs> distracting. I hadn't noticed. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I, I just don't think so. It was because, like, the, the, the more interesting visualization, the fact that it wasn't, you know, made it slightly more aesthetically interesting. Mm-hmm. I think the brick wall just really just tanks it. Yeah. It would tank it. We now go to Mr. Bill. So, uh, Mr. Bill, we first see Mr. Hands. He makes Spot. 
Spot needs a bath and he's dropped into a boiling pot of water. Mr. Sluggo comes in and, and stamps uh, Mr. Bill's face and irons him. He then marries Miss Sluggo and Bill loses his head as he goes to Niagara Falls. I didn't take good notes for this one, obviously. Um, I, you know, Mr. Bill just doesn't do it for me. But if, if you guys, if I missed anything, please fill in. No, nothing missed for me. I'm actually rather terrified of Mr. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> is this a new thing or is this goes back many years? This, this goes back many years. No, I was not happy to see Mr. Bill, but that's okay. I think I could appreciate him more now that I'm older if this one had been better. Yeah. But yes, just in general, rather frightened of Mr. Bill. Mm. I like Mr. Bill. Uh, they, these always make me laugh. Damn, Sluggo is such an ass. And I thought it was really funny that he might be dating Sluggo's sister. But uh, <laughs> yeah, these never fail to crack me up. I know it's the same fucking joke over and over again. But uh, there's something about the voices and the claymation mm-hmm. and the fact that it's done so terribly. Uh, it, it works for me. I, I'm still laughing at them. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we're about split, eh, Matt? I guess uh, between you and I and the third chairs, we're pretty split on Mr. Bill, I think. About 50-50, would you say? Yep, that generally seems to be the way. Yeah. We now have a Chiron. This person's four billionth in line for the throne of England. You know, someone out there is four billionth in line, I bet. Uh, Danger Probe. Dan hosts this as Dave Mabel. He talks about a hot July in the southern U.S. when two bigoted southern boys, to be played by Al Franken and John Belushi, and their reaction to an 18th century Belgian fop and his black manservant, played by Palin and Garrett. So we, we, we flip to a pub here, and Franken and Belushi are basically good old boys making less than politically correct statements. Garrett and uh, Michael Palin come in as what they say, an 18th century Belgian fop and his servant dandies, basically. And they say it's customary to kiss the uh, the lips of one's uh, black servant after sunset. Belushi gets a lead pipe and then Dan and the cops come in and beat up Belushi and Franken. Uh, this sketch was a complete mess. Uh, first off, it kind of ended before it started, but it's hard to say that because Dan had a big, long thing at the beginning Definitely some racial insensitivities in there, but I think what kind of bugged me was with maybe a couple of tweaks, this could have been quite funny. It would have been really fun, I think, to see Palin and Garrett doing a bit more of what they were doing and uh, Franken and Belushi doing a lot less of what they were doing. I will say one thing. Franken was almost unrecognizable, though, as uh, as his good old boy. Thumbs down for me on this one. Yeah, I also didn't like it, and I think for much the same reasons as yourself, Keith. I really wanted Garrett and Palin to do a lot more because the little tiny bit they did get to do was the only part that I liked. Uh, Danger Probe is definitely a show I would watch. If that was a real show, I would watch Danger Probe. Uh, Al Franken had a great accent, and Palin plays a really good dandy boy. (laughs) And when Dan comes in, I just just say that you've tasted danger. (laughs) I thought he was the star of the sketch. I liked it way more than you guys, but it does not make the air today uh, because of some questionable content. <laughs> for sure. We now have a Chiron, and this person would give anything for a mirror. We now go to the good nights. Michael has the two cats brought out to show them that they're all okay. Stagehands uh, stay there with the cats, and the cats get to do the good night. This is the period of time <laughs> where... <laughs> I was thinking about this. You would still do something that would freak the animals out. You know, live animals could still be like freaked out. But if at the end of the night you could say everyone's okay, the audience would be fine with that. Um, but uh, I did notice a very rambunctious cast. People were lifting one another up. Uh, Belushi had Lorraine on his shoulders for a minute. Uh, they really seemed really happy with themselves for this one. So, uh, yeah, anything from the good nights where he's glad the cats were okay. That's my note, that the kitties are okay. And yes, I did notice the lifting up. Poor Jane was the last one to be lift up, lifted up. That's She still got lifted up. Agree. Nice to see the cats. I have a feeling Jane was the last because they felt the need to ask her first. You know. And rightfully so. Yeah. They absolutely just grabbed Gilda and Lorraine and threw them up in the air. But Jane, they had to do it properly. So let's uh, let's rate this episode. So the host, Michael Palin. He was all in, and he mixed well with the cast. Problem for me, a lot of the material wasn't very good. He had some real fun character bits. 
um, but they didn't go very far. I actually think this was a pretty poorly written episode, but Palin enhanced all the material he was in, but some of it was so bad to start with that he, uh, even Michael Palin couldn't fix it. As a host, I think he did quite well, but maybe only about half of this episode was salvageable to begin with. Yeah, I think he did a great job with what he was given. Him flailing around on the floor during Chekhov was absolutely beautiful. His fops are always great, even in a stinker of a sketch. Thought he was a great host. I would agree. He he was certainly funny. The physical humor was terrific. He, and he really did blend in. He was used very well. Yeah, no complaints at all. I didn't stand out in a, in a super big way, but that's not necessary to be a successful host. I, I thought he did a really good job. So the music. For me, Eugene Record, what a strange guest. Definitely a break from the ordinary. Very unique vibe. Beautiful voice. I said it before, he's obviously quite the showman. The band was awesome. The set worked better than the usual set would have. Both performances were, were cheesy. First one, very cheesy. But that's probably why I liked it so much. I had never heard of Eugene Record before today. Um, and I love his performances. Thought they were super smooth, super sexy. Loved the set. Loved his suit. Loved his voice. Loved the talking breakdowns because I'm a sucker for a talking breakdown in a song. And then <laughs> just... Really liked them. I was uh, pretty 50-50 on it. I really liked the hiss, but uh, after the hiss, uh, that second song was really dreadful for me. Mm. Uh, I was just, maybe it was just the time of night and I wasn't in the mood. You know, it's late at night by the time this gets on the air. So maybe it was timing, but I don't know. This isn't really super my kind of music anyway. So if I could take it or leave it, I'd leave it. So what was the worst sketch of the night for you guys? It might have been the opening monologue. Okay. With the cats? With the cats and and the suit. And I don't know, there were good parts of it, but just it didn't land right for me. Understood. And, and is it the cats that put you off? No, because I was off it before the cats. Okay. Hmm. Uh, let me think about this for a second. Uh, I guess my least favorite was the confessional sketch. I really thought that went on too long and... Didn't really have any particular merit to it uh, comedically. Too long a setup uh, for that joke. And yeah, I just found it super boring, poorly placed in the show. Didn't like it. I went with Danger Probe. I really hoped we were going to get more from Michael and Garrett. And uh, I don't know. It just seemed like the, the, the feeling I got watching it was the good stuff was there, but they ran out of time. So they sent Dan in early. That's probably not at all what happened, but uh, what was your best of the night, Adrian? Check off. Yeah, it was also mine. Uh, the physical comedy in it was hilarious. It was had the laugh out loud moment of the show. And uh, I forgot to mention when we were talking about it, but I really liked how they just, when they had the ropes and he was getting into the crate, they just threw the ropes on top of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're going to have a sweep again tonight. Although, I mean, this is not as good as a lot of the other sweeps were. But it, maybe it's a testament to how, how weak tonight's show was. Um, but, yeah, I'm also going with the seagull. And who was your star of the night? My star was Jane. She was in a lot of sketches, and she didn't really fall flat in any of them. Excellent. Also, Jane, she's showing some real versatility. She was in complete command of Weekend Update. She's getting to do some voices, characters, pulling it off. Definitely. And I'm not sweeping with you there. I went with Bill Murray. Um, I thought uh, throughout he did a lot of different stuff tonight, and it was all really, really good. We had Todd. We had the uh, party argument sketch, the thing in the seagull, and even the uh, the Cockney cop. So overall, the first half of this episode had the danger and the edginess I really, really liked, but it definitely disappeared at around the halfway point. I like the monologue. I liked party arguments. I like nerds and I like seagull update was slightly better than usual, but that's not really saying too much, you know, watching update tonight. And, and I'm starting to wonder if it's this season that really kills Jane's legacy as an update anchor. Cause she's never mentioned in the top tier. I was really happy. We got to see the cats at the end. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the first half of the show had Michael Fing Michael Palin's fingerprints all over it. The second half felt as if people were writing things for Michael Palin, but he wasn't really involved in it that much. The sketches with promise were not fully realized, and the ones that were good were either like the nerds, which aren't even yet where they're going to be, 
the party sketch, which has that different style I really like, or or the seagull, which was just pure Michael Palin. Music was good, not really big enough to make a big difference for me. All things considered, I had to go significantly lower than average, but not so low it's it's a real stinker for me. So I went with a 6 out of 10. I also went with a 6 out of 10. The, there was uh, very, a pretty hit and miss for me. Again, the, kind of like Yuki, the music wasn't really uh, it wasn't a factor into my decision making because I thought that, you know, the one hit was OK. And then I just kind of mentally discarded the second song. There was no kind of weird extra segment like a Gary Weiss film or Kaufman Bells or whatever you want to roll out there. Um, but you know, it wasn't great. It was pretty sloppy. Sometimes I just didn't laugh and you know, it did the worst thing of all. Sometimes it was just really boring. So, um, I would have to agree with you guys and I'm sorry to use the devil's number, but I also give it a six. Okay. So that makes the average pretty easy. Six from me, six from Adrian, six from Matt. That's an average of six. The Internet Movie Database gave this a 7.7, which I sort of expected it would be a high one um, for a couple of reasons, mainly Michael Palin's name being on the uh, marquee. I also think this is one that certain senses of humor really would enjoy. You know, it only got me part of the way. The thing about this episode, too, guys, is I really felt like something was missing. It felt like maybe a sketch or two had been edited out, but the, the, the runtime is the same as everything else. Some of that stuff was going on awful long for me. There were a lot of longer sketches that felt like there was a lot less to choose from uh, for favorites or least favorites tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree completely. So based on the IMDb scores, this is the seventh highest rated of the season and 106 of all episodes to date. Um, that sounds about reasonable to me, even though, because I know I'd probably have it about five spots lower if I was to rank uh, the season, and we'll find out later where it's at. But, uh, but yeah, that seems about right to me. I think it sounds a little steep, but we got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Adrian, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is your last outing for season three, but I know we have you back for at least two in season four. I'm looking forward to it, and I've enjoyed Season 3 thus far. Awesome. And we're going to do some special things at the end of the season, and we'll have you back for those, too. Perfect. I can't wait. Fantastic. Matt, do you know who next week's uh, host and musical guest are? Yeah, you know, I forget. I heard it at the credits, though. I didn't know who they were. Yeah, it's Michael Sarazen, uh, actor, uh, actually Quebecois fellow. Um, I only know him from, uh, he did one episode of Deep Space Nine and, uh, the, the movie They Shoot Horses, Don't They, from the 60s. I also know he almost played, uh, John Voight's role in, uh, Midnight Cowboy. And the musical guest is jazz pianist Keith Jarrett. I like jazz. I'm mm -hmm. not jazz schmazz. I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna, is it gonna be an, an interesting one? Cause this is the first one of this year that it's one where I'm not at all familiar with the, host and the the musical guest so the cash of having somebody we're really fond of or really don't like you know we're going to be grading the show based on the show i think more so than the extra bits so matt and i will be back in about a week with episode 17 of season three that's michael sarazen and keith jarrett but until then we'll be putting cats in our pants here in sn hell 